Good afternoon and welcome to today's edition of In Focus. On today's show, we have a special guest joining us for the hour. Alanisa Bobswin is one of Canada's most distinguished documentary filmmakers. And we want you to join in on our conversation. Our phone lines are open. Call us toll free at 1 877 647 2786. You can also tweet us at APTN in Focus. Use the hashtag Elanise Obamswin. Before I introduce you to our guest, APTN will soon be premiering her documentary, We Can't Make the Same Mistake Twice on the network. Here's a look at when the documentary first premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival. The problem with incremental equality is that it hasn't come for First Nations children yet. This is a scene from We Can't Make the Same Mistake Twice. It's a documentary this that follows Cindy Blackstock's nine-year fight against the federal justice. government. Over Some that time, she observed. proved to a panel of commissioners so at the Human Rights Tribunal Canada. that Canada discriminates yeah, against First Nation children finish. by underfunding child welfare we services. Right Canada was ordered to make amends by paying up, something it hasn't done yet. That's very important for Canadians to understand that. Because they hear, you know, the government say, oh, we spend uh, billions of dollars. And so, you know, they have the impression that our people are, are getting more than others, which is quite the contrary. Obamsawin's documentaries highlight her passion for youth, where she focuses on the inequalities and social injustice endured by Indigenous children. Her inspiration, in part, because of her own childhood. I had a very bad life when I was a child. And I revolted against it, and I'm, you know, they used to call me an activist. I don't care about any of the names. I just want a better place for children. Obamsawin's career has spanned decades. Despite the recurring themes of injustice and discrimination, she doesn't feel discouraged. There's been a lot of work done and a lot of progress, and we have to recognize that. Because if you don't, then you think we're still at the same place and we're complaining and nothing. It's not true. Jesse Wenty has watched thousands of hours of film here at TIFF. And for him, Obamsawin is among the best. He believes the film's message and title is something Canadians need to take to heart. I think considering um, where the country is in the dialogue around Indigenous issues, where the government is trying to seems to be trying to make efforts. Um, I think a film like this is important to remind them that so much more is left to be done and that there's still promises that have to be fulfilled. And joining us now is filmmaker Alanisa Bombswin. Alanisa is a member of the Abenaki Nation. She has won numerous awards for the documentary films she has been making with the National Film Board and has directed 50 films during that time chronicling the lives and struggle of First Nations people. Elanice is also an officer of the Order of Canada, an activist and a singer. And it is our great pleasure to have her as our guest on In Focus today. Elanice, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us here today. Sure cold here. <laughs> it sure <laughs> is cold here. Oh and, uh, and you just came from even further north, yeah. and we'll speak yeah. about that in a few minutes. But first off, I'd like to, uh, to talk about the, the documentary we mentioned and that we'll be airing in the coming months here, and that is We Can't Make the Same Mistake Twice. And uh, as you mentioned in the, the story there, it was your own childhood that uh, inspired you to make that documentary. Uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. Um, it was very different in terms that it was the first time that uh, we were allowed to film in the courtroom because usually in the past, like uh, if you were um, documenting something having to do with the court, you could only uh, perhaps interview somebody in between in the hallway uh, but never allowed to go and film inside the court. So it was very uh, new and very challenging and I really uh, appreciated the fact that I was allowed to document the whole case which went on for as you know a very long time and uh, uh, to see for me to see our people in the courtroom respected and uh, challenged by uh, uh, lawyers and many different ways but 
In the 60s, I used to sit in courtrooms in different parts of, of our country watching lineup of mostly men <coughs> and women being uh, accused or guilty of uh, all kinds of things, many minor reasons for being there. But it was so discouraging because every person uh, would say, uh, you are accused of blah, 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 guilty, next, guilty. It, and it was r horrifying. It was so sad. And you just felt that our, spe uh, that our people were getting no respect and uh, just uh, treated very badly. So for me, this time, to, to have been able to document what was going on in the courtroom and seeing our people respected as, as human beings was very new and uh, made me feel uh, very special. Yeah. Obviously, uh, Cindy Blackstock plays a, a big role and yeah. uh, someone who's uh, frequently on our shows here. What yeah. was, uh, what was uh, your impression of her throughout uh, filming this? Yeah, it was also very difficult at the same time because she was uh, challenged. Uh, at times, I felt unfairly. And uh, I remember one time where I felt really bad of the way that they were really trying to take away her dignity, but it's not possible. And that was incredible to have someone uh, uh, in our world that is so strong and not being intimidated by anybody. So uh, it was incredible, really. You mentioned you spent a, a lot of time doing this. I understand there was like 300 hours or something uh, of film for this. Why was this an important story for you to tell? Because it had to do with rights of the children that are mainly at the reserve level and the unfair uh, system that doesn't permit them to get the services if they're not uh, given to the welfare system. And, uh, uh, you know, that is really horrifying because a lot of people, a lot of children that are in special needs and need uh, equipment or uh, financial services from the uh, system, um, the minute they're given out and they go from uh, welfare and different houses, different parents overnight, they don't get the love that they get from their own parents and at the reserve level. And this is what people were fighting for, um, to be able to get the services and keeping your child at home. That was the main uh, reason. And. Uh, it was very sad to <coughs> to hear people's stories and their children and how horrifying it is to have to let your child go in a, in the city in another town another mm -hmm. place and not being able to uh, be with them and visit them and it was bad still is but uh, there are a lot of things that are changing now it's um, perspectives. Uh, this week we're showing a number of stories, as we often do, on the, the child welfare system. And as you say, it's, uh, <coughs> it's difficult stuff. And this isn't the, the first time you've visited this issue. And yeah. uh, 30 years ago, you made the documentary Richard Cardinal Cry from a Diary of a Métis Child, about a Métis youth who died by suicide after years in the Alberta child welfare system. Uh, revisiting the system this time around, did you see uh, many similarities, many changes over those 30 years? In, it depends on the areas also. It doesn't seem to be the same everywhere. And uh, a lot of the things have not changed, and that's what's very scary. But I think there are efforts now, and with the, especially the uh, result of the uh, Human Rights Tribunal, it's making a difference. And, uh, but you, you can't rest. You can't just think, oh, everything is okay now. It's, you have to just keep watching and making sure that uh, the laws that are uh, out there to really uh, help the children, these laws has to be protected so that other children and other family goes through this system that is very, uh, uh, unjust. Mm. 
At the time uh, when you made the, uh, the, the documentary, Richard Cardinal, there was about 15,000 Indigenous youth in care at that time. Now there's uh, roughly 11,000 here in, in Manitoba alone yeah. in care. Uh, what do you make uh, of that number uh, 30 years on? Yeah. It's very sad, really. Um, the problem is, the, well, there's lots of problems, but uh, when, from hearing all the leaders uh, in the welfare system and uh, our own people that are working in it, it's, ve it's a very different way of looking at uh, what should be done. And the people who are in charge know what is needed, know what works, and it really has to come from them but the government insists on uh, obliging them to, to have a system that's not working. And uh, I think they're starting to see better, I hope. Yeah. You've just uh, come, as we mentioned, from a little further north from here, uh, showing your latest film, Our People Will Be Healed, your 50th film in, in Norway House, Manitoba. I uh, showed it yesterday. Uh, how did that go? Yesterday we started, uh, first of all, they, they were going to have uh, two showings, <coughs> excuse me, in the afternoon from 1 o'clock to 3 to, uh, from grade 7 to, to 12, and in the evening at 7 o'clock to the adults, for the public. And I was upset because I thought the little children are not invited, and they're in the film, and they're so <coughs> important. So. I asked them, f they said, oh, the, it's too long and the children won't be able to sit all that time. I said, well, let's then show part of it about the school. And we did uh, at 11 o'clock. And imagine this, the population is so high. At 11 o'clock we had approximately 500 children from uh, nursery to um, grade six. And we didn't show the whole film, but we showed part of it. And we had a little uh, problem in terms of, of sound uh, with the equipment. But it was so funny. When we were having a problem, the children would start to clap. <laughs> mm. <laughs> they're so small. They're so beautiful. And then we had another showing at 1 o'clock. Another more than 500 young people came from grade 7 to 12. And then we had um, another showing at 7 o'clock for the adults. And it was really, I was dying to see their reaction uh, watching it. And it's just so special. This is uh, your second straight <coughs> uh, film that has uh, some of its roots in Norway House, obviously, with mm -hmm. uh, Jordan River Anderson playing a role in Jordan's principal in your previous uh, film. Is that, uh, what is it that's drawn you to this community? Well, first of all, I fell in love with the school and the children. It's just uh, I have never witnessed such a way of educating at the reserve level where the children are really kings there. It's just beautiful, including the building, which is about 10 or 12 years old. And uh, even when you look at the building outside, you can feel the culture, the tradition. Uh, it's just in, the, in the, f the form of the building itself and the animal uh, engravings outside on, on the stone or the bricks, I don't know what to call it. And uh, it's the attitude. Like, um, the principal of the school, uh, when I was interviewing her, she said, uh, oh, you know, we're doing very well. Uh, grade 9, we had uh, 200 uh, students and then 10. 11, 12, it was going down, and we realized we had a problem. So we decided, well, we know that uh, teenagers like to sleep in the morning. So we added an extra bus. The first bus goes 8 o'clock, 8.30. So now we, we decided we're going to have two more buses, 9 o'clock, 9.30, and so that the teenagers have a, a little while to sleep longer. And that made, that's made a very big change. And so uh, by the time they get to grade 12, the uh, graduation is, is much higher. And in some of the places where I've shown the film, and uh, there's a woman in one place who stood up and she says, my son was going to school and uh, it was always hard to wake him up in the morning and get him to go to school on time. And if he was late, let's say 10 minutes, he'd go to school and the doors were locked. So you had to come back home, you, you miss a day school and then you're punished from it, for it. 
And it's the attitude of their seeing, let's change our rules, let's um, advantage the, the young people, make sure that they're in school. And, and she said, we tell the parents we'd rather have them late than not have them at all mm. uh, for the day. It's the way they think and how they, they say they do everything to make sure that the kids come to school. Just that alone is so different. Yeah. Yeah, and it's in everything. And uh, in, in many of the classrooms, they have children that are in special needs. They're not treated any differently than the others. And you can see the children uh, wanting to help and holding hands. And it's so nice. It's so different. I'm just, uh, and it all has to do with the leadership and the way they think about what children's needs are. You know? So it's very, it's very special. Our, our People Will Be Healed is a hopeful film, uh, especially compared to some of uh, you know, the struggles that you've portrayed in, in previous uh, films, one that shows the power of a school system that incorporates history, language, and yeah. culture, and, and what that can do for a young person. Uh, yeah. What was it like for you as someone who often makes films that are so heavy to, to work on something like this? Yes, I'm so thankful. For me, it's a real gift. I never thought that I would witness such generosity and caring for children. Uh, it's very special. And uh, I'm 85 years old. Imagine that. I feel so gifted that I lived all this time to see the difference, really. A community that... Uh, it all goes like I was explaining last night. Um, Children tend to do what their parents do and think that way. So you can tell that uh, the racism is out the window. And uh, the respect and the generosity and uh, wanting the children to feel good about themselves and giving them the tools for it is, is really out there. And I think it's a model not just for our community, it's a model for all school. What a difference. I just, uh, I'm very impressed and I just love them. <laughs> Elanise, why is it important for you to, uh, you know, this is a bit of a whirlwind trip from you coming from Montreal to Winnipeg to Norway House back. Uh, why is it important for you to, to show your film bring your film back to the community oh, and show it. That's the most important thing. I was really dying to come because I've come to Winnipeg about four or five times showing the film here to different groups that invited me. And uh, uh, Norway House was uh, they're so busy doing a million things. And it was only this date that we, I could come and they were ready to, to receive the film. And uh, I was very excited myself to just watch them watch themselves, how beautiful they are. Often I find that um, we don't praise the good things enough. You know, we, we often are too concerned about the problems and it, there's challenges uh, in every community. Mm -hmm. But to see so much loving, so much caring and so much uh, confidence of the future for this young generation, it's, we have to let everybody know that this is the way. And you know, one of the person there, um, uh, Gordon Walker, the title came from something that he says after having had uh, the Sundance come back. And uh, he's the one that says, our people will be healed. And. Uh, then again, you know, when I was told I could uh, film at the Sundance, I was very happy, but I was also very discreet and very respectful. We didn't film any ceremonies or anything like that, but from far, I wanted the young people to know that they have that for themselves. And that's where the real healing can come from, is from going back to certain traditions, a way of thinking and uh, caring and uh, the Sundance is a very old uh, tradition that uh, 
was badly judged by the newcomers at one time, and it became against the law to have any kind of ceremonies, mm -hmm. certainly the Sundance. Um, and uh, to know for our young people that there are places, traditional places that you can get com comfort and feel better about yourself and who you are and know that how rich those traditions are and take them away from alcohol and drugs and all that stuff and find a better place is very important. And um, that's another place, like uh, at the end of, uh, of uh, these ceremonies, you could see people just wanting to hold each other and feeling good and brings you to another place in your heart and in your mind that only those traditional ways can be helpful to your life. And I wanted young people to know that it's out there for them. And they're very lucky to have people who can still do these, those uh, ceremonies and help them out. And, yeah. Inspiring stuff. Uh, Alanis, we, we've got to step aside, unfortunately, for a, a quick break here. But uh, we'll be back in just a few minutes to continue the conversation here on In Focus. Join our conversation now. Send your thoughts in an email to infocus at aptn.ca. Like our APTN In Focus Facebook page. Follow and tweet us at APTN In Focus or call in toll-free at 1-877-647-2786. Join our conversation now. Send your thoughts in an email to infocus at aptn.ca. Like our APTN In Focus Facebook page. Follow and tweet us at APTN In Focus or call in toll free at 1 877 647 2786. In the early morning of March 10, 1990, the people of Kanasetake began a protest on a dirt road leading to the golf course. They were given until Monday, July 9, by the mayor of Oka to obey a court injunction granted to his municipality before calling for police action. Are you ready now to abandon the project? No. That's it. In the early 1930s, some people in Oka began playing golf on the commons. The Mohawks complained that their cattle were being chased away with golf sticks and that there was nothing for the animals to eat. In 1947, the municipality expropriated the commons. Even the Mohawks' burial ground became the property of Oka. By 1961, after many trees were cut, the private golf course was completed. Welcome back to In Focus, and there we're uh, watching one of Alanis's documentaries, one of your more well-known documentaries, I would say, uh, Ghana Satagi. 270 Years of Resistance, uh, released in 1993. It covers the Oka crisis that unfolded in the summer of 1990. Uh, Alanis, you spent 78 days and nights uh, embedded, basically, filming the armed uh, standoff between the Mohawks, the Quebec police, and the Canadian Army. Uh, uh, what was that like for you, uh, being there for <laughs> that entire time? It was pretty difficult, for sure, and because, first of all, I hate guns. And when I arrived there, the army had guns, the police had guns, the warrior had guns, and just that alone made me feel very uncomfortable. And I thought, man, I'm going to have to get used to, it, to this, thinking it might last uh, maybe five days. And it was never ending. And uh, it was um, pretty heavy, pretty difficult to, to cover this, but I saw so many people with so much courage and 
fighting for the land that I felt that I had to do it all the way. I understand you were working on, uh, since you never rest, uh, working on something else at the time and, and decided you had to get over there. What was it uh, that uh, in your mind you knew that this was going to be something that you needed to be there for? Well, I, I was driving my car to work and uh, there was a shootout uh, in July and uh, and I hear this on, on the uh, radio. So instead of going to the film board, I went to uh, Kanasataki. And then you couldn't get on, you couldn't get inside the village, the, the town, I should say, um, because there were uh, blockades, police blockades. So then I came back to the film board. I said, I'm changing, my, I've got to, to go back and document this. I'm changing my production. And uh, I couldn't find a sound person, so I was doing sound and uh, directing this, and oh, it was just uh, crazy. Totally the opposite way that I usually work, because I usually uh, go and interview different people, just sound first. And now it was like what they call guerrilla uh, filmmaking. You were documenting everything that was going on as it happened. It's a very different way of working for me, and uh, it was very difficult. You know. Were you fear, fearful for your own life at uh, times? Well, uh, you never knew what was going to happen, especially when the army came in, and uh, it was uh, pretty scary, especially at night. Uh, you know, there was no light, and any sound that you heard, you just ran there to see what's happening. and. Uh, we were doing things that we were not allowed to do every day, every hour. You know, we, were, we had an accreditation and the police told us you can't go on the side street and you can't go where the warriors are, you can't do this, can't do that. And we were disobeying that every day. And we, otherwise, we, you know, we couldn't have uh, documented what was going on. So it was not a very good atmosphere for going to work in the morning. <laughs> no. All those uh, decisions, uh, I guess you could say, uh, paid off in the end. Uh, 18 Canadian and international awards for uh, this documentary, important work. Uh, what did that do for, for your career and your filmmaking? Well, it's not so much. It's, it's wonderful because it really gives prestige to what you're doing and to the people that are in these documentaries. Um, yeah, that's very helpful that way, and the recognition of your work. But I don't use this as a career. For me, it's more uh, a mission that I have that I, I feel I have to do everything I can to uh, document what's going on and to go against injustice, and especially when it comes to children. And education is really my main uh, interest and I uh, just want to see changes. People often speak of events as being on the verge of uh, another Oka. It's uh, something that people refer to often. Has you, have you seen anything uh, like that since? Yes, there were uh, resistance in, uh, in at several moments. Um, of course, nobody wants to see another Oka scene, uh, but it hasn't, uh, the changes didn't come for the way that they wanted. The land issue is still not uh, resolved, mm -hmm. and there's still uh, that same problem is there in terms of uh, developers wanting to use the land still for the same reason to build condos, build uh, new buildings, and so they're faced with the same problem, really. So often uh, we see that, eh, and uh, some of the similar people from, from back then uh, still keeping up that fight now. Yes. Uh, I understand there was some trouble getting this uh, documentary to, to air in some places. Was that uh, the case for you? Was there some pushback to uh, airing this documentary in full? Can I start talking? Yeah. Oh, I know every problem possible at that time. It was funny, like uh, I won't name anybody, but uh, some channel were uh, saying, uh, "See, the the film is two hours long." So they thought that was very long, and 
I was asked, uh, you're going to have to make it 45 minutes, otherwise we won't show it. And I said, no, over my dead body, it's going to stay two hours. And finally, with all the criticism that it was a long film, it's still shown every year, uh, some channel uh, show this film, and for one reason or another, in its entirety. So it was very important to document this. Is that uh, something you've had an issue with over your uh, career, you know, getting these indigenous struggles uh, and uh, resistance, uh, these films to, to market? I don't work in that section, but uh, I know that uh, the main reason why I do what I do is to educate. And most of the films are, that I make are at the university level and, and in a lot of schools. And, and there's more demand as we go along all the time. And for me, I feel that I can make a difference there. It's all through education. Like, uh, you know, the way that uh, the school's books were written. And it's unfortunate because they were done uh, by the church. And uh, teaching, uh, I realized when I was a young person, by the time I was 15, 16, I figured something out. I, I realized that those books were written for one reason and that is to make sure there would be hate towards our people and they succeeded for a long time and this is what I stood up against and um, for me I was trying to figure out like oh, little me what could I do you know because when you realize this it's it's awful because otherwise you just think life is like that people throw racism uh, remarks and treat you differently and in those days, it was savage, sauvages. And, but I felt the children had to hear a different story. And that's where my strength came from. I didn't go in and say, hey, you liars, you're teaching bad things. Mm -hmm. But I came with a different story, and I could sing, and I knew my history. And that's how I started to uh, work towards that. And I was right. I feel that uh, I was able to help make a difference there. Mm. One of the uh, questions we asked uh, people online was whether there's enough support out there for indigenous filmmakers, whether it be financial or, or otherwise. Uh, was uh, f you know, getting financing support to something you've struggled with over the years, and have you seen any improvement? It was very difficult at the beginning. Uh, when I had problems, I immediately thought, oh, it's because I'm a First Nation person. And I discovered that being a woman was not a great uh, mm -hmm. help either. You know, that this is very interesting, the history of uh, women and children and our people. And um, learning these things, uh, as you go along, uh, as you're growing up, you're like at war all the time, you know, in a different place. And now, if ever there was a time where our people get help and it's very possible to do films or in the art world, to, there's a place, it's very different. There's a lot of help that we never had before. And uh, there's a big change there, and I think I would say, especially with the reconciliation and all the things that has happened in the last 10 years or so, you feel that <coughs> Canadians are really listening now and are ready to hear what the true story was, which is very, very different than in my time. You know? yeah. Many of the, if not all, these movies have been uh, done with the, the National Film Board. Uh, APTN recently yeah. signed a, a partnership with the, the National Film mm -hmm. Board. How important of a role have they played in, yeah. in getting these stories out there? Yeah, It's very important and it's very new and we're really well organized. And uh, many different institutions are part of it in, in Canada. And so the atmosphere is different very different and in terms of filmmaking there's uh, it's open and it's wonderful for young people who want to become filmmakers or and look we have aptn and uh, it's a very different time i think aptn shows everything as long as it's made professionally 
and broadcasting quality, it's fantastic. I think um, you say it's a fantastic time. Many of us would uh, have people like yourself to uh, credit for making it like that. Uh, Alanis, we've got to step aside for one more quick break and then okay. we'll be back here to continue the conversation on In Focus. What's your favorite subject in school? Gym. Hockey. Geology. I wouldn't want to go to school anywhere else. If I could take this school to Winnipeg, I would. Yeah. Knees. Nisto. Yeah. Hydrochloric acid here. All children have a right to learn, and all children are special in their own unique ways. Don't be surprised at what they can do. You know, it's all about the way you deal with people. When you show kindness to young people and you look them in the eye and you tell them that you care for them, that's where the trust comes in. Welcome back. That was a look at Alanis's most recent documentary, Our People Will Be Healed, her 50th, that's 50 50th documentary. Alanis, what is it uh, about the documentaries that uh, you're so drawn to? I love it. I just love it. I, I have not changed since the, the very beginning of my work in documentary filmmaking. Just the idea of listening to people and especially when I meet with old people and I always wonder how did they survive in such an unfriendly time for our people. And their story is for me sacred. I think storytelling is sacred. It's about life. It's about the life of one particular person. And I just never cease to feel so much hearing people tell me about how it was at a certain time and how they managed to live in very difficult times, yes. With all the tradition, the culture being massacred and against the law, how people, the, the, the guardian of certain tradition had to be done underground and in hiding. And so at the same time, what I find interesting is, um, I don't know if people will understand what I'm saying, but when poverty was not poor, I don't know if you understand that, through traditions, through um, developing uh, new things, uh, the food, harvesting, the animals, hunting, fishing. Our people were very smart. When you think of, I look at the boats and canoes, for instance, the science of, of uh, building a canoe mm -hmm. in a certain form, depending, are you going to go to the sea or to a lake or a river, the shape of, uh, of the canoe so that the wave won't take it away, all kinds of things. Snowshoes, depending on the kind of snow, the shape of the snowshoes, and how to make it and why. Our people were not stupid like they tried to portray us. That's not true. Mm -hmm. and I think uh, it's very important for us to know the history of each nation and what they developed with nature. It's nature who taught them how to live and how to speak, and the language. And uh, I think, for instance, singing, like I sing, and I have always sang since I'm a child. I discovered only when I was in my 30s, nobody taught me anything, like I, I learned by doing it. 
the syllable uh, chant, for instance, it really annoys me when I read that the anthropologists call that nonsense song. I think it's an insult because I think our people were so clever. For instance, if they were going to go to war, like I'm talking about my own people now, if the, the, there were wars between nations and they would decide, they would meet, and they'd say, at a certain moon, we're going to meet in a certain place and we're going to fight for the reason often having to do with territories. So people would prepare themselves. They knew at, at this certain moon there's going to be a very important thing in some people. And they would sing, and they would make fires, and they'd sing around the fire. And the syllabic songs, chant, which didn't have words, but you knew that this is a war chant, for instance. So you might have 500 people singing a chant that has to do with war. And the extraordinary um, knowledge you have a large people, large number of people singing one chant with the same sound at thousands of years old. And because it doesn't say words in the chant, it doesn't say, I'm going to war at a certain moon, nothing like that. It is just sound, which means if you have 500 people singing it, you have 500 different stories. Because as you sing the same sound and the chants that go high and low, uh, a person that's singing, you're allowed to go into yourself, to your heart, to the way you think. You might feel so sad because last time that uh, we had, a, I lost my husband. Another person might think of a story, my children got killed. And it's different for each person who's singing together the same chant, but everyone is allowed to go in to their own feeling and their own story about this war, this war that's coming up. And I realized that. I was quite old, I think, when I realized that. And I thought, how clever to have the freedom of having your own um, story, private, you have all these people who are think, thinking of having your own. You don't have to think of one story that everybody would sing and know this story is about blah, blah, blah. Now it's each individual can go into their heart and have all those feelings. And if you were to tape a, a chant, when people start singing, they repeat, there's a lot of repetition. You might sing the same chant, let's say for an hour. When you would listen to it, it would sound very different when they first sang that part. And when you get an hour later, the same chant would feel different because of all the feeling that in the voice of the people, what they feel each one differently. And you can feel it just from the way they do the same chant that you started an hour ago mm -hmm. and over here it gives you different feeling. Isn't that incredible? Like I, when I realized that, oh my God, I have so much love for the past. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Alan, you say, I feel a little uh, safer bringing this up now because you mentioned it yourself. And this summer you'll turn 86 years old, uh, 50 film. 85. 85? Hey, you're making me oh, a year Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> My apologies, but you know, 50 films over that period of time, uh, when do you take a break? When do you rest? Well, I don't really, but uh, I, I don't take my vacation. I don't have time. <laughs> it's not, um, I'm not complaining. I think uh, I owe to life and I want to do I don't want to waste my time. I had, uh, <coughs> there was five children in my family, t two boys and two girls who died as infants. And me, if I'm alive, it's a miracle because I was dying also. 
and I was on the reserve and uh, I was in coma and they were told I was going to die that night. And uh, an old aunt of my mother came in and uh, she, she was known as a medicine person. She wrapped me up in a blanket and they were, they thought that this was wrong. They were not supposed to move me. And uh, she kept me for six months in her place. And nobody knows what she did, but this is how I'm alive. And I feel that I've been chosen, that I've, I've had uh, this gift and I just, uh, I don't want to waste my time. I think I owe everything I can do for other people and especially children. Good uh, words to live by. Elenice, is there anything that you, you hope to work on still, a uh, documentary that you've been wanting to get done? Right now I'm, I'm working on a doc documentary for Jordan's Principle. I first went to Norway House, I don't remember whether it was 2010 or 11, and I've been going practically every year and documenting what's going on there. And uh, Jordan's Principle has a, a very important <coughs> sequence in we can't make the same mistake twice. Mm -hmm. But uh, with everything that has happened, I feel that I didn't want to just put another sequence of Jordan. I'm making a film just on, Gordon, on, on Jordan now. So we're in the, the editing room now. Important story, no doubt. Uh, uh, wondering, is there of those 50 films that you've already completed, uh, any, uh, any one in particular that's most memorable for yourself? Every one of them is. Every time I look at one film, I also see another film, how difficult it was to make for all kinds of reasons, especially at the beginning of, uh, of my work as a filmmaker. And uh, so, you know, I, my mind goes to what happened then and how I finally managed to finish a film was a, was a war in itself. So. It's very interesting, uh, when, especially when you do things that are dangerous or uh, people are angry. You, you know, when you make these documentaries, you have to know that this is what you want to do and don't imagine that people are going to love you for it. Some do and some hate you. Mm -hmm. You're always disturbing something which has to do uh, sometimes with government agencies, sometimes with people. and So you have to know what you're doing. and believe in it and go all the way and uh, for, for justice and for the good of uh, what a documentary can do. And uh, it's, it's a lot of work and it's, it's not easy, but it's incredible what uh, influence a documentary can play in terms of uh, uh, telling it like it is and showing justice and influencing people who have the power to make changes to think differently and to correct what has been done wrong. Yeah. Alanis, I think you touched on some of it there, but uh, as we're running short on time here, I'm wondering if you have any uh, words of wisdom, inspiration for those young uh, Indigenous filmmakers out there today. My main no. rule, I think, if you, um, of course I'm talking just about documentary making mm -hmm. now, not fiction to do the best work you can, the main thing is time. The best gift you can give to people that you're documenting is time. If you come there and say, oh, I have two hours and, uh, and hoping that you're going to find out everything you want to find out at that time, you're making a big fat mistake. You have to give time so that the person can feel trusting and feel at ease and not being afraid that you're going to do them wrong. And it takes time. That's uh, a good, uh, good advice there and uh, a bad segue for me as we're <laughs> out of time for this week's show. But uh, Alanis, it's been a, a real pleasure to have you here on the show today to, uh, to share your stories with us. and. Uh, Great to uh, have you sharing our stories for the past uh, however many years now, over 50 documentaries. Mm -hmm. So our thanks to you for, uh, for the work you do and for coming in here to speak with us today. Thank you. 
And unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today. Uh, next week, we'll be putting Standing Rock and the movement there in focus. One year after the camps were cleared out by law enforcement, what's the lasting impact? And what's next in the fight against the Dakota Access Pipeline, Trans Mountain, and other pipelines out there? Of course, this episode will be available for download as a podcast on our website at aptnnews.ca backslash podcast. If you've missed any of the shows, including this one, and want to catch up and check out the website, aptnnews.ca, this show will be up there a little later today. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you next time.